Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about preeclampsia. So what is preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is a pre-existing or gestational hypertension with new onset proteinuria and or end organ damage. And we'll talk a bit more about what this end organ damage is a little bit later. So it's estimated that about 4.6% of pregnancies worldwide are affected with preeclampsia. And preeclampsia is important to recognize and treat because it can lead to significant and deadly outcomes. One thing it can lead to is what's known as HELP syndrome. HELP H stands for hemolysis, the EL stands for elevated liver enzymes, and the LP stands for low platelets. This is a syndrome that is typically um, believed to be a subset of preeclampsia patients have HELP syndrome. can also lead to Eclampsia. Eclampsia is a seizure disorder. We'll talk about more about this in another lesson. Preeclampsia can also lead to fetal demise through a bruxial placentae. And preeclampsia can also lead to maternal end organ damage and dysfunction. So when we look at the risk factors for preeclampsia, there's a large list of risk factors. One is noliparity. So a woman having their first child is at an increased risk for preeclampsia than a multiparity uh, female is. Another risk factor is having a pre previous preeclampsia pregnancy. So anybody that has had pregnancies in the past with preeclampsia are at an increased risk for preeclampsia. Another risk factor is advanced maternal age, generally greater than the age of 40. There's also some evidence to show that perhaps younger women below the age of 18 are at an increased risk, so an early maternal age, but this has not been completely borne out in all uh, data. Another risk factor is family history, so there may be a genetic component with regards to preeclampsia. Another risk factor is chronic hypertension, so if a woman has hypertension before they get pregnant and they have hypertension throughout the pregnancy, they're more likely to become or have preeclampsia. Another risk factor is chronic kidney disease. Another risk factor is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And another risk factor is having systemic lupus erythematous. So any uh, women with lupus can be at an increased risk for having preeclampsia. Other related conditions um, can include Inherited thrombophilia, so individuals with inherited thrombophilia can have increased risk of having preeclampsia. Other vascular or connective disease or tissue diseases can increase risk for preeclampsia. Having diabetes can increase your risk for preeclampsia as well as being obese. So we generally look at the pre-pregnancy um, body mass index, BMI, if it's greater than 25, that's a risk factor for preeclampsia and that risk increases with increasing BMI. So why does preeclampsia happen? Well, there's some theories as to the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. When we look at the, uh, in this picture here, so if we can picture or imagine this is the uh, uterus, so here is uh, the decidua, here is the myometrium, these are spiral arteries. So in a non-pregnant, this is a non-pregnant um, uh, case. Here's a preeclampsia and here's a non or normal uh, pregnancy. So when we take a look into why or the theories as to why preeclampsia occurs, one of the first ones is an abnormal placentation or a shallow placentation. So in individuals with preeclampsia, the placenta doesn't burrow into the decidua of the uterus as well as it should. So you can see here in this uh, image, the preeclampsia uh, placenta or placentation does not go as deep as the normal pregnancy does and is not as widened out as well. So that's one of the theories as to the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. It's an abnormal placentation. Another um, theory is that there's defective trophoblast differentiation. So 
the trophoblastic cells here, they don't differentiate properly. These are the cells that are responsible for burrowing into the decidua of the uterus and or the in the metrium of the uterus and they don't differentiate appropriately or adequately. Another risk factor is there's a failure to remodel the spiral arteries of the decidua and the myometrium, which normally occurs early in pregnancy. So usually the trophoblasts are involved in remodeling the spiral arteries, but there seems to be a failure to remodel the spiral arteries. So they all, all of these theories and causes are connected to each other. They have to do with trophoblastic activity, not able to burrow into the endometrium of the uterus, and not able to um, remodel those spiral arteries appropriately. So these are all possible uh, pathophysiological causes of preeclampsia. So what are some of the signs and symptoms of preeclampsia? One of them is headache. So individuals that are that have uh, preeclampsia or are beginning to have an onset of preeclampsia often note a headache. Some other ones include vision changes. They can um, note a photopsia, scotomata. They can note um, blurry vision in their periphery. They can note flashing lights in their in their vision as well. They can also have a new onset of nausea and vomiting. They can have right upper quadrant pain. And this, you can think of, um, when you think of HELP syndrome, those elevated liver enzymes. So think about the liver um, when you're thinking about um, anybody with preeclampsia, so right upper quadrant pain. They also have new onset swelling, and particularly in the hands and the face. And they can also have hyperreflexia. So how do we diagnose preeclampsia? Well, as we mentioned before, preeclampsia requires hypertension. So we need a systolic blood pressure greater than 140 or diastolic blood pressure greater than 90 on two occasions, at least four hours apart. So when we take blood pressure readings, we want to check at least twice, four hours apart. If we see it greater than 140 or greater than 90 or both, after 20 weeks of gestation in a previously normal tensive patient, that is the diagnosis for gestational hypertension. But to make the diagnosis for preeclampsia, we need something else. We need at least one more of the following. One of those is proteinuria. So um, proteinuria greater than 0.3 grams in a 24-hour urine specimen or protein creatinine ratio of 30 milligrams per millimole or a, a dipstick greater than one plus, that will indicate proteinuria. We can also um, make the diagnosis if we have platelet count less than 100,000 platelets per microliter. We can also make the diagnosis if the serum creatinine is greater than 1.1 milligrams per deciliter. We can also make the diagnosis if we um, look at liver transaminases, and they are at least twice the upper limit of normal. If there's pulmonary edema, that's also a indicator of diagnosis of preeclampsia. Or if there's any other cerebral or visual symptoms, so any new onset in persistent headaches not responding to usual doses of analgesia, um, blurred vision flashing like sparks, uh, or scotomata. So Basically, we need hypertension after 20 weeks of gestation with at least one of those other following proteinuria, low platelet count, increased serum creatinine, liver transaminases, pulmonary edema, so you'd see this in shortness of breath, and cerebral or visual symptoms, so a new onset and persistent headaches, uh, blurred vision, flashing lights, etc. So once we've made the diagnosis, how do we treat and prevent preeclampsia? The treatment involves using antihypertensives. One is labetalol. We could also use nifedipine or hydralazine. For seizure prevention, so when we think if there's a risk for 
uh, ending up um, having eclampsia, we might want to use magnesium sulfate. And the prevention of preeclampsia, so in patients with high risk factors, there is some evidence to show that um, using low dose aspirin can help to prevent or decrease the risk for preeclampsia. So anyways, guys, that was a quick lesson on preeclampsia. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.